o'clock, I call the uh, meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is approval of minutes, January 4th, 2022, and January 18th, 2022. Is there a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. 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 Is there any comments or questions on the minutes? Being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Next item on the agenda is discussion, community preservation master plan sketch draft version one. Jamie. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, to the uh, CPC. So uh, I called it a sketch draft, because that's what it is. Um, but I hope it um, uh, is kind of a first crack of a discussion. The goal of tonight's meeting for everybody would just be to try to get any feedback from the members uh, of the committee or answer any questions that anybody has on any of the proposals, the projects, uh, the organization typos, you know, really could be anything at all. Uh, the goal was to try to just have a first draft out there for some consumption, get some feedback from everybody, uh, as noted in here, uh, notably on the Nason Street tot lot. Um, you know, we would hope by May or June we'd have a final number on that and then we'd plug in the actual number based on the quote. Um, and as time moves on, we, we hope to get our first assessment um, uh, on what we might receive in November for the state matching dollars. So, um, so just, it's just time for discussion questions. If you want me to walk through it, I'm happy to or, uh, or answer anybody's questions. Does the board wish to have them walk through it, or do people have specific questions they'd like to ask? I'd like them to walk through it. Can you walk through it? Sure. Yeah. Quick walk through. All right, quick. <laughs> Can you read the whole I'll thing? jog. <laughs> uh, it's called a run, not a walk. It's called a run, not a walk. Jamie, yeah, sprint. Uh, Jamie, can you read the whole thing? Verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, the first section is just the history and uh, introduction to CPA with some links and a little bit of background on the election from 2020. We added in here the town bylaw, um, how the committee was uh, selected, or at least the inaugural committee uh, was accepted. And then just some a uh, couple pages of background on the original, the first meetings of CPC. Uh, we went through some other reports, and um, you know, hopefully this will be a living document into the future as well, um, so that 10 years from now, when people forget how all this happened, at least there'll be some sort of record of, of the initial uh, year uh, of the CPC, which is exciting. Um, and then uh, we obviously fold right into the Maple Hill purchase. There's a section in here uh, uh, specifically on Maple Hill um, to give it uh, a little bit of a success story. Uh, on page six, um, which is section two, we have the fiscal 2022 budget and financial summary uh, of note to maybe folks watching at home. Um, are there people on Zoom? Yep, there are. Um, uh, we've spent uh, approximately uh, $12,000, uh, a little bit over $12,000 in administrative costs. One for dues to the Community Preservation Coalition. Uh, a second was uh, for an appraisal services from John Nees uh, on the Schmidt Farm property, uh, as well as uh, wetland delineation and field survey uh, for a couple parcels for affordable housing, and a fourth expenditure. Um, the last two have not ac actually the the United Consultants has officially gone through and the bills uh, in process of being paid. Um, the playground inspections uh, for Nason Street Tot Lot is administrative cost. Uh, that is a quote. Uh, that we did receive to do the assessment and design of Nason Street. And uh, Ryan and the Recreation Department are going to go get that project going and hopefully we'll have an exact price of what it will cost for the Nason Street tot lot uh, with ADA accessibility as well. Um, and as you can see from the first year, um, uh, the town did do uh, its uh, 1.3 million in collections which then transitions into section three on page eight. We do a bit of an administrative breakdown of the different category of reserved accounts, which are those three main accounts, open space, affordable housing, historic preservation. And as you can see on page nine, and then on page 10, we have a few charts. Uh, the first chart is revenue projections for FY23. So ultimately, that'll be the budget before CPC uh, in another month or two, which is for just under 1.4 million in anticipated revenues 
uh, from the local contribution. Uh, we were supposed to know by the end of March what the state match contribution is, but we don't know that number yet. When the state match number comes in, that chart will be revised to include that uh, anticipated assessment. Last year, we would have anticipated about a 40% match on our dollar, so 40 cents for every dollar, so about whatever that is, another 450,000 or so. Um, the CPA reserves in page nine is the second chart, um, which shows the balance now in each of those five accounts that were authorized in the budget last year. So the expen administrative expense recount is at zero on July 1st. We didn't spend all the money. I'm just gonna point out the money that's unused automatically goes into the budgeted trust fund reserve, which you see is 917,920. If you went back and looked at FY22's numbers, you'd see a difference of about 56,000 that was unspent. So that's your budgeted reserve at a minimum going into next year that would have authorization for spending. Um, and then of course the one, the other two accounts on there um, are, the, uh, are the same amount of reserves that were carried over from FY22 and FY23. And then if you look at FY on page 10, you'll see an FY23 total budget available. Again, this does not include, for the record, the state matching dollars. If uh, we get that assessment at some point, we get an estimated number, then you can add that number onto that total uh, in the budgeted reserve. Um, and then finally on page 10, uh, in page 11, we have the scoped budget borrowing schedule for the Maple Hill open space. This is the exact same borrowing um, schedule that everyone saw last summer when the community went forward to vote on Maple Hill. I will spare you the discussion, unless somebody wants to, about how we borrow, and when we borrow, and when the interest gets paid, et cetera. I see hands going up in the air, please no. Um, so we'll move on. And it's all documented right here about how that's gonna happen over the next 20 years. So fast forward then to uh, FY23 uh, budget recommendations, page 12. You will notice in there, uh, in the budget will be a payment number one, which is interest only. Interest for two years will be the upfront payment for Maple Hill. The principal will then be paid out, in F will begin payment in FY24, um, which would be 137,000 for the interest. Um, and that will come close to sufficing the open space requirement, not completely the 10%, pretty close. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other expenses throughout the year that we can have an open space, but none jump off uh, immediately. The most notable is I am working with the DPW and other staff to try to get together a plan, um, and it may be coming back to CPC for some of the open space money uh, to begin the uh, master planning of the Maple Hill parcel, which is not just limited to Maple Hill. There's some Metacomet land that, that is around that whole area connects over to the school property, Keller Sullivan. There are some potential trail networks, so any expenditure that we did to meet that open space requirement for FY23 would probably also include that. The staff right now is working on um, getting a quote to see what that would cost. Um, I don't think that'll be ready for this budget, but we can approve that after the beginning of the fiscal year anyway. Um, so I'll keep everybody uh, posted on that. Uh, on page 13 are the, the three uh, well, two historic preservation projects, there is a third in the other category, but is to uh, appropriate about $200,000 for the Redbrook Schoolhouse project. Uh, I just realized I called it the Ride Brick <laughs> Schoolhouse project. Hope that wasn't a Freudian slip. Um, but the Red Brick Schoolhouse project, uh, happy to go into more detail if folks have questions, but I think everybody's pretty knowledgeable what's going on up there. and. Um, and then the uh, affordable housing project to meet the requirement of the 10% would be, our recommendation would be to appropriate the 10% portion from FY22 as well as FY23 toward the Franklin Ridge housing project, um, which they're now right now designing based on a mass uh, housing grant. Um, they're now designing the sewer system uh, and septic up there on that project. Um, and I'll be honest, DHCD, as I note in here, uh, is really looking for additional financial commitments. This is important for us 
because this will then get us over over a million dollars in local contributions and grants toward that project. I have been told by Congressman Auchincloss recently that if there's ever federal money that's needed for Franklin Ridge, they need to see the state commitment first, which is understandable, um, and the state says we need to see your commitment first, right. and fully understandable. They've got limited dollars, it's a big project, it's shovel ready, it could really be a big win for the town, so um, even a modest contribution like this does help a lot and help in our advocacy efforts uh, to the legislative delegation to make sure that we're in good shape with uh, the ARPA 2 Beacon Hill legislation where hopefully uh, we can get some federal stimulus money towards this project as well. But that would accommodate for FY22 and 23. Jamie, just a quick clarification. Sure. You're saying in here the town is required to spend for FY22. We're not required to spend that money. We're required to allocate it for a future source. We could do something else in the future. That's exactly right. Okay. So you said it, so you're required to have that allocation. So the FY22 10% requirement for all three categories if you do not spend it, it automatically gets carried over and stays in that trust fund where the remaining 65% balance outside of admin costs all stay in the budgeted trust fund. That's okay. correct. Yep. Uh, and then item D where we have the budgeted reserve. Uh, we have a few projects in there. Uh, the first is for the town clerk uh, for some records preservation. Uh, my educated guest tells me this is the first request out of uh, hopefully more. Um, and uh, I know King Information sure. Systems well. They do an incredible, incredible job at this stuff. Uh, the second project out of the budget of reserve would be the cupola up at the Historical Museum. Um, I think that's a, a tale we've all heard. Uh, a great picture in there. Thank you, Alicia. And, um, and the Nason Street tot lot, uh, that's an estimate. It's a pretty good estimate, um, about 300,000, uh, where we would bring that up to uh, an ADA code. Um, to make sure it's accessible for all. Jamie, is that a, an average lifespan of a playground of about 15, 20 years? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and then the last section, uh, Chair, is section four. Um, this really tries to capture, I think, um, random thoughts from town staff. I'm sure there are more on here that will get added. This is probably one of the more fluid sheets, but we also did add in here um, uh, some of the priorities that came through the public comment. If you notice on number three, recreation. Um, Fletcher Field was really the next big, the playground was really the next big uh, capital request from the recreation department as part of their uh, five to 10 year capital plan. Um, and I've asked for a legislative appropriation in the state budget this year from our legislators to see if that is something that the state will fund. Um, and uh, I have, uh, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but um, uh, I do know that our elected representatives are putting in for that funding. So we'll see how the state budget comes out in the summer. I'll remain optimistic, not just cautiously optimistic. <laughs> um, but the real second one was the design and redevelopment of King Street Memorial Park. I know uh, the Recreation Advisory Board recently, I think just this week, appropriated some money from the Fletcher Fund. But this is really a bigger project, I think, that's been lingering around for a while and needing a, a, a pretty much a big improvement around the whole park. But obviously, the advocacy, I think we all got the message, pickleball is popular. Um, there were some great comments put forth, and talking to Ryan as well, that there probably is a greater bang for your buck around pickleball if you have all the courts located in the same spot. Um, it's just when you get the leagues going and get folks down there instead of driving all the way around town, at least to get four courts down there uh, would, be, uh, would certainly be a big bonus. And in the future, if pickleball takes off and becomes an Olympic sport, um, <laughs> then maybe, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe we can look at some other parcel up on the north side of town and see where it's going. But I just wanted to highlight it, that in there. And uh, one other project to highlight is number four, Historic Preservation in the Old South Church. Uh, as many folks here may know, the town did issue an expression of interest proposal that is due to me on uh, April 29th. Um, and so hopefully the next iteration of this plan in May, or J May, probably May and June, 
Um, we'll have some updates relative to that if there's anybody that shows interest. Um, and uh, you know, I think that this kind of checks off possibly a couple boxes. Um, one, obviously historic preservation. The council has made it a big priority to protect the facade. Uh, but also uh, from a housing perspective, where uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody was trying to evaluate that, um, that piece of land uh, for a, a hopeful renovation unit or two uh, as part of that. So there may be kind of a double whammy, if you will, or double opportunity of uh, both affordable housing and uh, historic preservation dollars. Um, but we're gonna, that's a long process. Um, April 29th, any interested parties? It doesn't, we're not gonna get site plans out of this, just so everybody knows. We're not gonna get fully baked uh, uh, number crunching here. Uh, we're just gonna get probably some letters uh, that uh, interested parties may be looking to sit down and discuss the property. Ultimately, the uh, town council will have to issue an RFP, a true request for proposals to bidders on however they decide to use the property based off the interested parties that come forward. So if five people come forward or five uh, organizations, the council's gonna have to decide where they wanna go and what's mostly advantageous. Um, we have had an open house already. There's another one on April 11th, next Monday. Yeah, you're, you're gonna come check out the South Church. Um, on April 11th from 10 to noon, there'll be another open house. Um, and so folks can come and take a look at it. Right. Chair, just out of curiosity, are there limitations on what can be done with that property? If, Absolutely. If somebody purchase it. Yep. Parking's the biggest issue. Um, and depending on what it's used for, uh, ADA is, is a big issue. Um, all those are prevailing wage rates when the town does the project. That's a 35% markup pretty much right there. Um, so at, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it's, you know, someone coming in for another use outside of residence, you know, maybe small business. I mean, if you had a, uh, you know, a small practice of some sort, if somebody really wanted to put the labor of love in and had the skills, it could certainly be for that. Uh, but parking is really the that? biggest issue. Is it zoned It's that? not. So the council would have to change that as part of that RFP. And then we uh, have five and six just documented the residents who showed up uh, for the public hearing. Does anyone have a question? I have, I have two. Okay. Some page six. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, which one? When, no, no, I said sorry earlier than that. When you, when you took the poll, I'm just curious. When you took the poll when I, uh, the vote, Page two. When you took the poll of uh, people whether they were opposed like, or not to the uh, CPA, did you collect reasons why people said no? I'm just curious. Do we have any of that information? We don't. Um, I don't know if there's any exit polling out there or you know folks that were talking to people. Um, I, I try to remind myself this was a, over a two week period because this is when early and mail in balloting was happening. Well, um, I have had uh, numerous people uh, qualitatively uh, approach me and say that they were angry about the tax increase that they didn't vote for it, right. which I understand. Okay. Um, but I have had a lot of people tell me um, that the Maple Hill purchase um, soothed some of it. Okay. Um, so I think some of those no's um, you know, could have turned into yeses, but in full respect, some of those yeses, you know, once they got the tax bill, might have turned to no's. So um, those aren't usually people that always call me, um, but uh, I don't have any other data other than the, the vote total that was at the ballot. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is just simply that if indeed that we're going to run into a wall of opposition, because 37% is a pretty big chunk of the population, that's pretty big. It, yeah, a third. A third is a big number. It is. It's a big number. It is. So it would um, be interesting to know what that third thinks, right? I mean, if, it, if it's just simply taxes, God, I don't understand. But there's something behind that. Like, well, you know, Franklin 
waste money. Right. Right. You know, for example. Okay. Well, that's not something we can actually address. Uh, so I would say. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the the opposition would be. I would say though that all eight communities that had CPA in the ballot in the presidential election in November of 2020, all eight passed. They were eight for eight. Uh, and they're on a winning streak right now. Lakeville passed it last night. Um, so they're really, for the last year or so, I think they've had almost, I can't even think of a town that's voted against it. Well, um, I think- it's Statewide, I say that statewide. Yes, but the, the, the proof of the pudding is come back three years from now and yeah. ask those same, that same population yeah. what they think, whether that was a good idea or not. Yeah. Right, because I mean, we would do anything for, that, for at least a year and a half. One of, the, uh, one of the goals, if I can get to it, um, is to, uh, for the council and myself, is to have a citizen satisfaction survey. Yeah. And a citizen satisfaction survey is not just like a poll we put on Google. Um, what I'm proposing is to, uh, I'm supposed to be, but the pandemic uh, killed it for a couple of years. I'm supposed to enroll and be a member in what's called ICMA, which is basically the National Mass Municipal Association for all 50 states. And they have science, they have a whole department uh, in the International County Managers Association that do scientific satisfaction surveys. Uh, when I was at Hopkinton, they did one, the first one, and they did a second one recently. And so they do a scientific random sample, and then they do a, a, a link that you can put online that everybody can fill out, and you look at the numbers. This would be a great, CPA would be a great question on that survey. So if I can ever get to that in the next year or so, that would be a really, really good opportunity because ultimately in a year from now, if I could get that going, you get a contract, you're really two years out from doing the survey and the results would be three years. That would kind of line up with three or four years out from CPA with some projects that have been done and probably some reserves and maybe people, you know, that would be a great opportunity, I think, to, to see how people see CPA you know, a few years later. It's a great point. Um, another completely different question to the topic, page 17. Historic signage. Do we have? I'm just curious. Are there are there standard rules about historic signage, and is it is it is it are those rules laid down by the state or by the county or by the city or all three? That's an excellent question. And later this fall, uh, Vicki Earls is going to answer that question for us from the library. Um, uh, uh, I don't. I, I believe there is probably some consistency that the federal government puts out. Uh, nationally Registered Historic Places is obviously a federal designation. Um, the state normally with their signage is, ex is they tell you exactly what to do. Um, but my guess is, is there's probably some guidance uh, within reason from a federal standpoint, depending on whether it's a national park, a national monument, Federal forest, you know, I think there's different rules for different agencies and different things. So no I don't know the exact answer whether we have to have signage ubiquitous across the board. But what I do know is is there are two federally recognized historic districts in town that in seven years here I've never heard anybody talk about. And uh, it was actually the tour to the Red Brick Schoolhouse. Uh, to which I got back from that after uh, Vicky was there, and I'm kind of laying her out, but I've already talked to her about this. And she gave me an email this long about all the research that they have at the library on the Town Common Historic District and the <laughs> Dean Junior College Historic District. The Dean Junior College is a historic district uh, federally recognized, <clears throat> just saying. So it was fascinating read. I, I read it over five times just to see, because it, it was a lot of information. And I thought that she really needs to put that out to the public so I think people understand that we have these areas that are, uh, you know, are probably worth preserving and looking at. Yeah, yeah the only reason, the reason I originally was asking mm -hmm. the question was because if indeed there are certain costs or processes in addition to just local review, then we would have to obviously want to know about that and budget for that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll let, uh, I'll figure that out at some point. That's why it's kind of on the list for or two from now. No else? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Jamie, so much for putting this together. This is uh, excellent. Um, question, so page 12 on the uh, Maple Hill open space, and um, again, not to get into the whole uh, repayment schedule thing, but um, 
Just a clarifying question. So at the top, I um, mentioned how payment one interest only for Maple Hill open space borrowing is estimated 137,000. Um, and then later down in paragraph three, mentioning how um, we voted unanimously to pay 212,000 every year. Um, so is, are we going to be paying 137 or 212 in FY23? Just a clarifying question. So the 137 is an estimate. Okay. Um, what we're actually going to do is go and do the borrowing in fiscally after the start of the next fiscal year. And um, we work with financial consultants on when to go out and do the borrowing. We're also packaging these together so folks know with other borrowings. This isn't the only thing we're doing. And so for FY23, <coughs> it is correct that the 137 number, uh, and just so I clarify, that's assuming a 3.5% interest rate. So if that interest rate drops or goes up, that number is going to go up and down with it. But the reason is, is that when you borrow in the next fiscal year, meaning let's just say July of, of this summer, the principal then would not hit until FY24. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we have market watchers that are trying to watch all this stuff and we work with them with our finance team. And this was their recommendation was to go into the next fiscal year, do the borrowing for several borrowings that we're doing. Um, and then, uh, and then the principal wouldn't hit until FY24. So I'll make a correction on there that 212 will be a different number. Okay. All of those numbers, by the way, are going to be different based on the interest rate. Unless the interest rate comes in at exactly 3.5%, yep. all these numbers are going to juggle a little bit. Um, and then that principal of 212 would hit in the following fiscal year. So that would be for the FY24 budget. So 212 is principal and interest. Principal and interest. Yep. Okay, so 212 is like the, the approved amount, and 137 is the right now the estimate for what might actually be paid for FY23? Jamie. No, it's, yep. <coughs> so the, the 137 is an estimate of the interest for the first year of payment. Yep. Right. And the 212 is an estimate of the interest in principle going forward okay. after that. Gotcha. In FY24 forward. FY24. All right. Correct. Thank you. Jamie, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Again, not understanding the economics, mm -hmm. but given all of the turbulence in the financial markets right now and projections of particularly this next year with projected anywhere depending upon what analysis you read from 8 to 12 interest rate spikes over the next literally the next 18 months. Um, how does that affect like municipal bound rates and therefore the interest rates you're likely to have here? It's a great question. You know it's at some point it just becomes the good old fashioned gamble. I think what the good news for us is, um, is, you know, my hope is, and I'm not trying to raise expectations too high because we've heard from numerous sources in the past that the town of Franklin cannot become a triple A barn rating town. Um, what, is it, what is it now? It's double A plus. Okay. So we're one step away. Okay. But since we've gotten that rating, the town's passed CPA. Council has approved a stormwater rate. Our fire department's now one of two suburban communities in the whole state, one of 15 in New England, an ISO 1 <coughs> rating for fire departments for public safety. And in June and July, our police department's going to be a fully accredited police department. I could go on and on and on, and I won't. But at some point, these rating agencies are going to make a mockery of themselves by not giving us a AAA bond rating. Um, I'd love to believe that we can get that it's somehow in place before we go out to borrow in the summer. Because right. I think to your point, all of this stuff we're doing and our stabilization funds, we've been able to save more funds as well. Those are all good financial practices. I'm hopeful if I'm a bond rating agency, I see that as good. And even if we don't get the AAA right out of the gate, I think all those other factors will be uh, hopefully uh, amounting to a good you know, competitive rate despite the market fluctuation. Can we lobby for that? Huh? Can we lobby for that? Yeah, oh, like we do. Hard? Yeah. I, I mean, because yeah. it's stupid. It's just dumb. It, literally, at this point, and this was the conversation last year with our, with our rating agencies, was simply the fact that we were such a large community and the commercial industrial base, the size of everything, in and of itself, they basically say, yeah, that the size and scope and structure of your town just has liability associated with it. They had no That's real reason. Stupid. I know. That is but since then, way to look at it. what we've done is just really gone all in to, 
to just continue to it push them in a corner. I'm sorry, this is obnoxious. Yeah. It works exactly the opposite. It totally. It's called financial ballast. Absolutely. So that's what you have, right? Yes. You have financial ballast, so you mitigate risk across all the different classes. So the ergo, your entire your overall risk goes down. Yes, you get and that's stupid. It's it's. We should have a we have, should have a massively higher bond rating on Shareborn. Come on. He's not this here, so and I'm stupid, and I'm embarrassed to sorry say this again. But you Finan know, last I'm year sorry, I'm not a big fan of financial people. Sorry for anything. <laughs> I, have to, I have to deal with VCs all the time. So. <laughs> and risk. Okay. As our finance director uh, eloquently said on the call last year, what is it going to take to get a bleeping triple no A? I mean, it's no just, kidding. it's just, and it really, you know, and what do you I, want? and it came with, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. the right thing to say. Well, what about the salami trays? What do you want? You know? Well, that's Come why on. I say, you know, if you look at the profile in the last 18 months, you know, what else is it that we can do as a town to show we're reducing risk, even on the stormwater issue? I mean, we're still continuing to, re that's a classic example of where a bond rating agency is going to say, aha, we got gotcha. you, right? We found the little hole yeah. in your game. And yeah. it's like, no, you can't even find that hole in our game, you know? Uh, so we'll see what happens. Did you, know, you try um, New England Patriot season tickets for them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in sales. I think so we're that... getting off track now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just annoying. To do that. We do such a good Franklin job. High football, maybe. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Just a follow-up question, Jamie. So with the um, with the payments for Maple Hill, you know, the you know, 212 and FY24, whatever is going forward, um, because that's open space, does that money need to come out of the open space reserve fund? Can it come out of the budgeted trust fund reserve because it's because open space is part of the umbrella? Can it be a combination of both? Um, just or does it matter? Combination of both. We would want to take as much as we can out of the reserve to go open space so we're not committing to anything more. You mean the, the open space? Choice. What's that? You mean meet the 10%? Right. And then the difference would come out of the budget reserve because then you have more flexibility. Correct. Okay. Correct. Absolutely. You want to always, and, and I think Stu said it at the meeting when we had the training, always best practice. If you have projects of the 10% categories, get those out of the way each year because okay. then you have much more flexibility with the rest of the money. Okay. Thank you. To the point, uh, you, you have to come up with the money. Oh, sure. Name, address. Social. How does he not know that by now? Rick Ciccone, Chestnut Street. To the point of um, the, the bond rating, is that a matter of public record, the bond rating, Jamie? Through yep. you, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yep, you. You're fine. Yeah, I believe we have him on the, I think we have him online, at least the uh, last one. Are there cities and towns that are AAA? Oh, yeah. And, the, and who, would they, who might they be, if I may ask? If you, choose, uh, you might know them. More affluent communities with less population. Such as? With less business. Dover, Dover Weston, uh, Hopkinton, Holliston, uh, Southboro, uh, Medfield. Medfield? Um, yeah. yeah, probably Wellesley, maybe. Uh, I can't speak for that. But you know, that's the profile I'm trying to articulate. It's usually communities that are probably half our size, More much rapid. less commercial industrial, less traffic, less big business, less power plants, that type of stuff. But affluence also could can Yeah, because ultimately the ability to pay is a huge issue. The fact that they've had two, you know, and I think, you know, previously the overrides that have failed, you know, those have been hits against that argument because citizens and whatever for whatever reason aren't willing to raise taxes. You know, um, you know, but CPA is a voter-led initiative. Those are voters. The council just approved the stormwater fee. That's a legislative issue. Uh, still, all reducing our liability. Jamie, what's the difference between AAA and AA plus? Twenty basis points. Probably twenty. I was going to say ego, <laughs> <laughs> bragging rights. <laughs> yeah, twenty. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's de minimis. That's why it's frustrating. So we may never reach that goal. You can, I mean, you will try to attain it, but because of the, pro, yeah, uh, it, the town we have, it, it seems, because you and your predecessor for years tried to get it over that hurdle and as of yet. And you created more stabilization accounts and more backbone to a lot of our departments, and it doesn't seem like it's kicked it over yet. Thank you. We'll see you this year.
Okay, we're not a town of landed gentry. What's that? We're not a town of landed gentry. Yeah. That's fun. You know, when you have a 95% residential tax base and you always do an override to fill awesome. school budgets, it just, it just, awesome. it's just, you know. Jeff, when you speak, could you speak loud? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Just does anybody else have any um, just quick comments of these proposals? Is there anything I'm, we're missing or that folks want to see or not see? Just as we move forward and get the quotes for Nason Street. We are working on a comprehensive quote too for Red Brick Schoolhouse, uh, which will be in the next report as well. Thank you. Yeah, that was my comment. I, I would like to see the red, work on the Red Brick Schoolhouse. You bet. Inside and out, it's part of history. So you, Mr. Chair, the exterior is going to be phase one. Once we get the exterior and the brick repointed and the structure and all that going and the paint and the wood, we'll work with the off, we'll work with the tenants on trying to come up with a phase two. I think it's at the end of the report for the inside as well. Who, who are the tenants? The Metro West Robotics Club, a nonprofit based in Franklin. It's a lot of Franklin kids uh, that go to high school here. Uh, there's other kids as well, uh, but it maintains, and Mr. Chair, you might, if I get this wrong, you know, don't shoot the messenger, it's the longest running one room red brick schoolhouse in the country. Yes. Did I nail that? Thanks, Wayne. Yes. Thank you. They were the only bidder. So they're renting it? They're renting it. They're in year four of a, t they're in year four, and the lease is year to year now up to 10 years. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we, no? Do we need to vote on the budget? You don't. Uh, at either the next meeting or the June meeting, when all this gets packaged up, we'll come back to uh, the CPC with the recommended budget, the authorization resolutions, and all the required votes and paperwork for everybody to do. Okay, so we don't even need to vote the 5%? You do not. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, motion. Well, through you, uh, the formula that sets the bill. First of all, I mean, this tax bill was the first time we saw a. I don't know if we call it a tax or a fee or. It's a surcharge. Right? Surcharge. Okay. <laughs> this this tax bill was the first time we saw that. Yeah. Okay, and we will whatever number you saw on. And I'm asking this for a number of seniors that the coffee break seniors will call. Them. The number that you see on your tax bill this month will multiply times four, and that will be the number for each individual taxpayer. Is, am I correct? Is no. that all? No. No. Each? No. Okay, Chris, please. It's going to be recalculated every year based on the value of your property. And but how is that? How is that formula set to the amount? How do you? I've seen how we are going to do the. Uh, Stormwater and listen to that ad nauseum. Uh, the, uh, hey, you, you know, came. Without, you came to the events. We, we, I tried. I just, uh, I, and we'll continue. Um, and I'm not against any of this. I'm a tree hugger. So I'm not against this. I, I'm just looking for, and some of my friends, but my, uh, my uh, folks coming back from Florida, the snowbirds are asking the question when they first saw their tax bill. Does that mean if on my tax bill this quarter is on CPA of $125, does that mean I'm paying $500 a year towards CPA? That would be the, the clear cut question. No. No. So the number will vary? Yes. So it's just like your tax bill gets adjusted every year based on the tax rate and the evaluation of your property. So the is surcharge, the what's that? Yeah. Percentage of that. It's a two percent. Just, just so you also know, CPA. We, the town, adopted the provision that reduces the surcharge of a hundred thousand dollars off your valuation of your house. So, if you have a three hundred thousand dollar house, it's the you know the tax rate times three hundred at three hundred thousand, but the surcharge is only on two hundred thousand of the three hundred thousand. 
there's a provision in CPA that allows you to take that hundred thousand the first valuation off. It is what percent? It's it's always two percent. The surcharge will never change unless the voters voted again. It will always be two percent of your tax bill. Did I explain two, that correctly? Two, did you write two percent of the value of your home minus the first hundred thousand? Exactly. So if someone, if I'm, I'm, I'm confused. No, go ahead. If, if your home was a set, it's a five hundred thousand dollar home, mm -hmm. and you have to take away the hundred. You're now you're at a four hundred thousand dollar home. So you should be assessed two percent is what? Eighty thousand? Eight thousand? No, eight hundred. What's two percent of four hundred thousand? Chris, <laughs> it's eight hundred. <laughs> he said, okay, so, so you, it should be two hundred dollars a quarter mm -hmm. on your tax bill. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So the formula is two percent on the the number. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, not debatable. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.